Good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to another edition of Faris Trailer Radio Podcast. This is your host, Andy McFarris. And I thank you for the listeners who have been listening to our show until now. And for the new ones, welcome and I hope you're going to enjoy the show. To learn more about Faris Trailer Radio Podcast or to read some news about paranormal, metaphysics, ancient mysteries, science and spirituality focusing in the Australia and Far East Asia regions, go to faristrailer.net or exoticfiles.net. You can also purchase my book The Exotic Files on the website or you can also listen to my other interviews from the links provided on the website. My special guest today is Stephen Strong. Stephen Strong is a former teacher who is now an author, researcher, and historian in the area of human origins and their connection to the Aboriginal people of Australia. Together with his son Evan Strong, they have been living and learning from the original people of northern New South Wales. They have also written three books so far and a new one is going to be released very soon. They relay what the original elders insist are their historical truths and then find science and the most reliable historical sources that validate their truths. Up to now, this has brought them into a fascinating territory and conclusion about human origins. To learn more about their work, their books, or to contact them, please go to ForgottenOrigin.com. In today's interview, we discussed about the Aboriginal or original people of Australia, theory of human origins from Australia, not Africa, and the connection to the Pleiadian, and much more. Welcome to Far East Trailer Radio, Stephen Strong. This is such an honor and privilege for me to have you on my program. Yeah, no worries. And I've read your website, I've gone through and browsed your website, and um, it's so vast, and I don't know where to start. It is, this is just amazing so before we do everything first of all please give a bit of background about yourself to our listeners in case they don't know who you are and they just wanted to have a bit of uh, description about who you are in their mind my background is i'm, I'm a teacher mm-hmm. um, and over the years i become heavily involved and i actually helped write the um, aboriginal studies course for new south wales mm-hmm. and over the last 25 years, I've become more and more involved with your Aboriginal community. And then it came to a stage all about five, six years ago where I started writing these books and I realized I could either be a teacher Mm. or be an historian, but I couldn't be both because to, as you said with our website, it is so vast and there's so much to this story that we just became overwhelmed. Mm. So I had to make a choice. Stop Mm. teaching and start writing, which is never a great um, I'd say economic um, option, but yeah. I had to do that because the elders were now sharing things with me that they weren't sharing with others. So we've come into this 
Um, from the point of view of originally, we were going to write a book about Gnosticism, to mm -hmm. be honest, when I began this, and then it sort of changed gradually to the stage now where every word we write is vetted by elders and guided by the elder, uh, Aboriginal elders of this country. So it's a it's an unusual uh, journey, and I'm not really sure where it takes us, but we're certainly beholden to the elders now. Okay, so um, I read about you a bit that you have a background in archaeology. Could you expand on that, please? Well, yes and no. I've got to be careful with that. Yes, I, I did go to university when I finished teaching on one occasion, and I did a couple of years at uh, uni, but I'm not an archaeologist as such, and I mm -hmm. made that clear. Mm -hmm. Although I do work with archaeologists and I have got the skills because I did a couple of years and I know what I'm doing out there, I we tend to call ourselves, Evan and myself, more historians, and that, that mm -hmm. leaves much more open. Mm -hmm. I would never, never conduct an official dig on my own. I'd always do it under guidance. But I can, when we're wandering through the country, we can make some fairly useful decisions about what's there. So we're more historians, and our role is we, we tend to, get people to gravitate towards us that have other skills like in Egyptology and in geology. We've got the gentleman who was the uh, head professor of Sydney Union Geology advising us. So what we tend to do is when we hit an area where we're not sure, we have someone in our group that can guide us. So we're, we're very much a collaborative approach here and there's probably about 15 people in that small group. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. So I'm just curious, um, how come the elders, you know, they, they, they put their trust in you to, to, to relay their messages to you uh, in the first place? Well, um, it's a tricky, it's a good question. And um, there's probably no real way you can answer this properly. I think the fact that, well, I've, I've lived, I've lived in a street where 366 Chester Street and was the only white fellas in the whole street. That we've lived with original people, that we've worked with them, and I did a lot of teaching, and I spent a lot of time with original kids. So I think it's a build-up of a lot of things. You have to mm. win your trust. Mm. But you've got to put runs on the board first. And then the other thing I learned mm. when I started to, to, to be introduced to elders, mm. white fellas have a real problem with their mouth. They can't control it. They've got to keep asking questions. Well, I learned that when you're with the elders, you never ask a question. They'll tell you what they want to tell you. So you learn a different way of walking into a culture. Mm -hmm. And you have to discard a lot of the white baggage we have. And sometimes I might even call it garbage, but we'll leave it at that. Yeah, so what you have to do is to walk in to the elders and let them know that you're not here like many other archaeologists to give them your point of view or tell you, tell mm -hmm. them what you think. Mm. You're there to hear what they've got to say and to prove to the rest of the people that they're right. Now, that's the approach we've taken wherever we've walked. Mm. We've never walked in saying, we think this. We've come in saying, what do you think? Tell us what the answer is, and then we'll try and see if we can prove what you're saying is right. So I think that does help a lot. We never go anywhere preconceived. Mm. I mean, I've got to be honest. There have been times when I've said, we're not going to make this statement. We are not going to go this far. We said that twice. I remember at one stage, one of the elders told me when I said this, and this was a gentleman who gave a ceremony with the Ram and Jerry in South Australia, and I said I would never, never mention UFOs and aliens. Mm. And he looked at me and laughed and said, you will. I yeah. said, oh, but I'll need archaeology. He said, you want it? You will get it. Don't worry. And the time will come. So really, when we go out and field, we go out sometimes and I ring up an elder and say, guess what I've found? And this, I think I've really done well here or we've done well. And they laugh at me and say, yes, we're wondering when you'd find that. Now, what about this? So really what we do is we've learned our place in this, this game, and that is to basically do what we're told and go when we're told. Okay, so I've got the impression that basically you should have respect towards the Aboriginal culture and Listen, is that right? Yes, you've got to learn to stop the mouth and open the two ears. We have two ears and one mouth. When you're with the elders, when you sit around with the elders, they may tell you stories that take half an hour from start to finish, and you might wander all over the place, but never, never interrupt that. You just let it go. You learn to listen. And that's an art we don't have anymore, and that's an art the original people have always had. I mean, we're under pressure now, and obviously things are changing, but that's the skill to listen. Yes, yes, yes. I totally agree with that. 
And um, forgive me if I'm quite if I'm quite um, ignorant about the Aboriginal cultures because in the beginning I wasn't really aware or interested in Aboriginal culture because I, I didn't really understand it in the beginning. So there's no offense, but no. Um, but after reading about them and you know um, listening to some podcasts like yourself, etc. So I have more admiration and I have more respect towards the culture. But one one more thing probably you can explain to people that pro- that also probably a, a bit ignorant about this. Um, the Aboriginal people in Australia, as also called the original people, yeah. um, they, um, they, they, they don't consist from just one tribe, is that right? They have so many tribes. So could yeah. you explain on that? And which, and which tribes uh, are you are you relaying message from? Well, um, to begin with, yeah, there are 500 tribal nations in Australia. Mm-hmm. Now, when we came here, we decided to call them Aboriginal, and I'm glad you picked up the word original because that's the word they prefer anyway. Ab means abnormal. But uh, yeah. when they came here, when we came here, they had 500 different languages. It's very much like if you say Europe is one country and they're all European. You can imagine how the Italians and Spanish would feel about that. Yeah. Here with the assumption they're all one group. Well, they're not. They are 500 different groups. But I've got to make a point here. Mm-hmm. Very important point. Yes, there were 500 different groups, and each of these people had different languages. But wow. that's to say that there wasn't a overriding um, sort of central principles within this country that were sacrosanct. And it's not to say that if you weren't from another tribe, there wasn't a universal sign language, which there was, and people mm. didn't understand that. So you could communicate with anyone in this country, and that is not to say within each group, mm. the person who carries the messenger stick. Now, that person, they think the message stick is on the stick. It's not. It's in the person's head who has learned all of the languages of all the tribes they may either come in contact with. So... Yes, there were 500 different nations, but I tend to look at them more like autonomous states Mm. within the dreaming. That was the unifying principle that kept them all together. Now, the beauty of that principle is, and it's a very important principle, under the rules of the dreaming, each autonomous state is owned by that those people or their custodians of that, and the spirits created them alone to that place. So that means you, as a different tribe, can never walk onto that place unescorted, and you can never invade it, you can never take something from it. Mm. Now, that differentiates the Australian experience from all other experiences where it's conquest and power of the biggest army. Here, it makes no difference. You always fought on common ground, and the women would decide when the war was finished and they'd all walk away. So there is a big difference here. We seem to think, oh, there are 500 different tribes. They must have been fighting against each other like we did. Mm-hmm. No, they found a way to overcome the testosterone and anger that blinds a lot of men. Mm-hmm. By saying you can never steal another person's estate, country, sites, resources, or anything. In fact, if you walked on that site without permission, the spirit of that place would kill you, and you knew that, so you wouldn't do so, yes, there were 500 states, 500 different languages, 500 different cultures, 500 different dances and different mythological stories, but there was something that bound them together. And that's the part we didn't pick up when we came in. Well, that's amazing. But before we continue, could, could you explain to me what's the meaning of dreaming? What is that? Ah, uh, uh, the dreaming. I've just written, in fact, I've just written, we've written a couple of books now, and one of my actually was asked, you've got to talk, talk about the dreaming. I mm-hmm. use the dreaming like a teenager uses the word like. I seem to use it for everything. Mm-hmm. Well, it basically is. It's not a religion as such. It's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's a set of social mores. For example, in the dream, um, I can never speak to my mother-in-law. I cannot put my shadow on a food or she'll throw it away. And if I want to make contact, I would do it through someone else. Now, that's the same throughout the whole of Australia. There won't be a change to that because that is the dreaming. There are rules there about where the girls sleep before they become old enough to marry. That is part of the dreaming too. But it's also the spirit who creates you. It's Mm. also your obligation to the land. In fact, what the dreaming is, it's a lifestyle, a set of lifestyle codes 
that are solely religious in inspiration, but cooperative in implement, implementation. So what you actually have is when you're born, you're born into a tribe. Now that tribe and that land is where you'll always be born. Now do you realize what the worst punishment in Australia could be for someone who broke the law? Would be freedom. Mm. You would think, what, what do I mean by that? It means that you would be banished off your land and you could never come back. So when you die, your soul cannot reincarnate back in the country, so it will be lost in the ether forever. So in a rich man, if he had a choice between being speared to death or being set free, mm. he would say, spear me. Now that is where you get a fundamental difference in approach towards the land and your relationship. So if you throw a piece of rubbish on that land, that's where you live forever. Would you do it? No, you wouldn't. So that's what the dreaming is about. It gives you a connection to land and it gives you a reason for being there and it gives you an obligation to look after the land forever. Mm. You don't have the dreaming anymore now. We have money and societies and entrepreneurs and capitalism instead. We have different sorts of philosophies, but I'm not so sure they're as strong as that one. Yeah. So are you saying that culture is diminishing now? I'm saying that the original culture is under a lot of pressure at the moment because of what we brought into this country, but I'm also saying I know there are many, many cultural men and women that are calling back their old ways, and I know they're doing this right now, and they have not given up, and they are fed up with where they are, and I know there's a big, a strong call from sovereignty led by Margaret Murtry and others. Mm. No, I think they're coming back, but they're under pressure. They're under pressure for sure. Right. So uh, just before we go to other things, uh, mm. so there's f- about 500 tribes. Are they still e- in existence right now, or many of them died out? Uh, probably 300 are still in existence, but a tribe only lives while the language lives. Once the last language speaker is gone, mm. it can't continue. You see... You've got to understand later on this year, I'm going to be taking an incredibly important site with my son. Mm-hmm. We have to spend a week before we can walk onto the site. And we have to learn the language, the words. Mm-hmm. We must have to say, otherwise it doesn't work. Well, my point is that once the language is gone and the culture goes, so yes, we've lost a lot, but there is a revival in Australia and languages are being brought back um, and there would still be 300 left. But that, the language and, and the songs are important. Without that, their culture and their link to land will actually die. So that's what the original people are trying to do now. And they're trying to re in, uh, re that in places where the language is gone. So they are, they're still fighting back. Mm. Okay, that's amazing. You know, I heard these funny stories from friends of mine saying, in the past, when the convicts came to this country in the beginning, because of their encounters to the Aborigines or the original people, rather, um, they um, they influence their language. So that's why we have this um, sort of interesting Australian accent, like saying "Good day, mate," <laughs> or something like that. And uh, is that is that true? Yes, definitely, definitely, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Irish and, and the Aboriginal people shared a common hate for the British, and I can show I can assure you there were actually revolutions that took place in the start start with the Irish and the Aboriginal people fighting together against the British. So, yeah, they were very close. I think you're also going to find we're working with a lot of Irish. And we're finding, I know it sounds a long way apart, we're finding some incredible links between the two two cultures. There is more to it than what you'll ever begin to realise. So, mm. <laughs> and the country of this land, mm. you'll find when you go to the country, you go to any country, you'll find the language changes because of the mm. land. Mm. Because of the land. So, yes, we do. Start. We are starting to pick up a lot of Aboriginal, uh, let's say, idioms and, and the way we speak. Mm-hmm. I know that in my case, once I did an interview with a national sports uh, group when I had a football match on at Moree, mm-hmm. and um, they asked me some questions, and I remember saying, oh, there are hundreds and hundreds here, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm sounding just like a black fella now, because they don't... <laughs> They don't use the letter H, and here's me saying hundreds and hundreds, and by do- I got served up by the teachers, I can tell you. Uh. I thought to myself, well, I don't mind. I don't care. If I'm starting to talk like a black fella, we all will. So, yeah, you're right. You're right. We, the Irish are very, were very empathetic to start with the original people because they both hated the same oppressors, the British. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, for me, uh, this world, this earth is one. Anyway, it, we only live in one planet, and in the end, I think everything will be connected together. Everything is connected. I think in the end. The original people, and I've got a quote on the back of a book, and I'll say exactly what it says there. It says at the end of the quote, all peoples of the world come from us, according to the original people. So when you say we're all one people, that's exactly what the original people have been telling us from the start. We all are one people. Wow, that's amazing. Now, let's talk about, because I've, I've, I know that you, you have written two books uh, and another one in, in the making, soon to be released, is that right? Well, we've written three, and there are oh, two three. things up there. Are, there are two coming out in the next couple of months. Yeah. Okay. Could you could you just talk about those books, just in short, just to give some yeah. idea to people, please? Well, the the first three books we wrote were published by University Press of America, and we did that because we wanted to go through mm. a reputable academic group to let people know that what we're saying isn't just some hippies up the back here living near Byron coming up with this wild idea. And basically in those two books, we trace the fact that the original people left Australia around 50, maybe much earlier than that, and we're inclined to think much earlier now, 50,000, maybe 100,000, 200,000 years ago, and sailed throughout the whole Pacific Indian Ocean Rim. And they landed in India. They landed in Malaysia. They landed in Siberia. They landed in Japan. They landed in America. And they set up settlements through there. And that's why the elders say all of the people of the world come from us. Mm. So in those three books, we look at that. Now, in one of the books, Mary Magdalene's Dreaming, we also look at the impact the dreaming has had on every religion on this planet. And we find nine identifying principles you will find in all the legitimate copies of the dreaming. And we claim around about five to 6,000 years ago, before, well, as we started to get money and farming before that, the whole world lived under the tenets of the dreaming and the original people had wandered out through the rest of the world before the Africans left Africa, well before. Mm. A lot of people think, oh, we came out of Africa. What your listeners need to understand is no, we did not. In fact, the two people who wrote the paper called out of Africa and gave us the person Eve, who probably lived in Africa. They never said definitely. Within 10 years, they both recanted and said, my God, we got it wrong. It was much older and it was Australia. So that's basically what we write about. And in some of those books, we also look at the links between the Old Testament and Gnosticism Mm -hmm. to the dream. And we chose that because this is basically a Christian country. So we thought, well, we won't do Hinduism because we can see that. We won't do Buddhism. We'll look at the long links between the Gnostic Christians, the Old Testament, and the dreaming. And they are massive. In fact, yes. if, if you go through the first five pages of the dream, of the Old Testament, I can find you six links to dreaming stories in the first five pages. They are everywhere. Wow. In the dreaming, in the dreaming, humans were made from the dust of the ridges. In the Old Testament, we were made from the dust of the ground. And it will go like that. If you look at the Old Testament, you will find that everything comes out of the dreaming. We have an Adam and a Eve in the dreaming, and we believe that all, all religions, because culture comes from this country, and our genetics come from this country, we also believe that all religions originally came from here. And then over a period of time, they changed, often for the worst. Wow, that's interesting, that's interesting. Yeah, that's what those three, first three books are about. The ones we're writing now about the, the discoveries we're making in this country. Mm-hmm. So the first three give us a base. And, of course, we do spend a lot of time looking at the links in religion because people look at religion and say, oh, look, it's been redone and re-added and stuff like that, and it has. But people have need to understand something. The religious books were the historical books to begin with. Nobody wrote an historical book per se, until quite recently. All the history was contained within religious narratives. Now, yes, sometimes they were played with, but you will find there's a germ of truth within. So we should look within the Old Testament and the Bhagavad Gita and all those old books, because within it, there will be a lot of history, and we should not ignore that. And that's what we do. We look at that too. Mm. And it amazes me as well with your work, because... um, you publish your first three books with a very credible publishers, which, mm. you know, 
the one who deals with serious ac- academic things, and that that's a kudos to you. Well, it was deliberate. We had an option, and I've got to tell you, my son wasn't that impressed. We had an option of a large amount of money through a very, very popular press, owned particularly by a person I would never like to publish through. And we've gone through them, but we would have had to take out all the academic rigour. This way it goes through a panel of academics first. In fact, for the first two years when they wrote back to us, they kept calling us doctors. We were the only people they had published that weren't doctors, and we kept it that way. And we went that way because instead of taking the money um, and going the other way, the sort of Von Danik and Menzies approach, we thought it was more important and more respectful for the original people to let people know that what they are saying is not just something that gets published by a New Age press group, that can be published by a group in America that are renowned for their publications. In fact, they've only done one other publication from the Australian group ever, and that was University of Queensland. We're the only other group that they've done in one, and they did three with us. Because the rigour and the science in what we put in here is strong enough for these guys to say we will go down this path. And what people don't know, and it's rather sad, in America, it is common knowledge and a huge debate at the moment that the Australian original people have been in that country from 12,000 years, and we're back to a date of 40,000 they're prepared to accept. Mm -hmm. There are dates coming out of America now of original people being there hundreds of thousands of years, maybe even 600,000 years. And this is strong, strong science. So there is such a story at the moment that's spreading all over the place. And unfortunately, Andy, it doesn't get to one country. Yeah. Australia. (laughs) Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it, how how that things could happen. Uh, Anyway, back back to um, what you said before, the proponents of -of out-of-Africa theory and confess that they might be wrong. Yes. Sadly enough... Um, you know, when you watch documentaries or even probably they still teach this at school that they do that, at every school. Yes, they do. Yeah, they still, they still, they still told this, this, this saying that people come from Africa. Yeah. Now look, the reason for that was up until about a year ago, and this will be coming out in one of our books very soon. In fact, probably in about three months called Shun. Mm. The reason was they had done genome studies, of every race basically bar Australians. You understand that? Now, the genome is a complete mapping of your genome, what it is to be that particular race. So they've never mapped an Aboriginal person. They've done Desmond Tutu's group and they've done um, Darwin. They've done all sorts of people. But what they did was about a year ago, they got a hold of some hair of an Aboriginal that's 100 years old. Mm. And they finally, they spent a year and a half on a Danish group run by uh, Professor Erickson. And they finally mapped the Aboriginal genome. Mm. Now, Andy, I can't believe why it didn't get into this country because it's turned the scientific world upside down and still has. Because we had the Aboriginal people being the last race to come into being after Europeans, after every other group, right? Mm. All of a sudden, they said, oh, well, we've made a small mistake. We'll put the Aboriginals up as equal first. We'll take them from last and put them to first. Now, that's a big change to begin with. Now, the reason why they put them equal first is because they're as diverse, more diverse than the Africans. But what they said was, well, we've got to make them second because we know that the Australian Aboriginals got to Australia 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then all of the paper is, well, we put them second, but it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. And in the paper, they say, you can't put geography in here. And if we do this, it creates a series of puzzles. Now, I won't go into the reasons why. But what they were saying very simply is that the Aboriginal people, they don't fit. Their, ge- their genes just do not fit anywhere. Mm-hmm. Everyone else fits in. If you take the Aboriginals out, it's not a problem. They are the most diverse race in this country, and they have the highest mitochondrial diversity. Now, what that means, my friend, is that every 3,500 years, the woman's mitochondrial um, DNA has one mutation in it. You can put a clock by it, right? Mm-hmm. You can put a clock by it, and you multiply it. Every time you find it... I, a mutation in a race, be it Caucasian, you multiply by 3,500. So if you've got 10 mutations, then the race has been around for 35,000 years. Very simple equation. The Aboriginal people go into hundreds of mutations, hundreds and hundreds. In fact, 
When Wilson came out, the guy that wrote the paper, he came and sampled 31 people, full descent Aboriginal people, and got 22 different mutations. That's 70%. The rest wow. of them were on 5%, 8%. He's getting 70%. And he said, well, that's 22 times 3,500. That's 77,000 years. I can go back in this country already. And remember, the Danish mob thought they were only 50,000 years. He said, but what if I sample more? Will the number increase? Will it stay at 70%? So what we have is the mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. The name tells us the original people are either the oldest with the Africans or much older. Now I've got other, I've got other findings. Can work with Wilson said that the Aboriginal people were 10 times older than the Africans. So what we have here is a set theory that we all came out of Africa, but the mitochondrial evidence and the genome evidence says that's a pack of lies. We came out of Australia. And I remember when Wilson, and the reason why this didn't take catch water is the year after he made this recanting, he dropped dead. So there was no one to push it. You understand how this works? If the researcher is not out on the boards there selling, no Mm. one wants to listen. And when it's news like this, who wants to listen? Mm. He found out he came to Australia twice before he recanted. He came down here in 87 and 89 and died in 91, unfortunately. And he found, my God, I'm up to 77,000 years. If I keep doing this, I'll go into hundreds of thousands of years. And that's why he said, Homo sapiens started in Australia 400,000 years ago. Wow. Wow, that's really blowing my mind. <laughs> and, yeah, I can add something to this. I don't know if you just know if your readers are aware of this, but there's been, just got out, it's the diaries of Roswell. Mm-hmm. But O'Donnell was the nurse that nursed that particular alien that stayed there for three years at Roswell. Mm-hmm. Her diaries just came out. If you go to page 67 in the diaries, mm. He tells us where humanity began. Mm. And he tells the children, 1947, he says, ah, humans began in Australia 400,000 years ago. So I've got an alien telling me Australia 400,000 years ago. I've got Professor Wilson, who was considered the top molecular biologist in the country, saying 400,000 years ago in Australia. But every book and every academic will tell you, oh, no, no, it came out of Africa about 60, 70,000 years ago. And it's still. Well, everything you said so far will turn everything we know in archaeology and anthropology upside down. Uh, yes, but unfortunately, Andy, or fortunately, here's the trick. When we come to this country, and I, I was working on some glyphs, some hieroglyphs down at Carrion, Arnie Bev Spears, who was the custodian, darking on custodian, the last full, fully initiated keeper of law, she told us the hieroglyphs. They're young. We had our own language that was here before the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. And I've looked at that language, and I'm going to tell you now, if you yeah. think the story about the original people being the first people is true, which it is, now I'm going to give you a clue here. Wilson said this, and so did Ken, the two people who worked on this paper, and this was the trick. They said, yeah, 400,000 years ago, the original people turned up and they become Homo sapiens from two lineages. Now, one they think is Homo erectus. What's the other one? They didn't give one. Mm-hmm. By the way, the alien from Roswell gave one. What is that? Them. He said, you're a cross between us and the hominids. You see, when we talk about Homo erectus evolving magically into Homo sapiens, there are some real problems with that. Number one, where did the voice box appear? Because Homo erectus could not talk. We know by the size of its neck it couldn't do this. There are some major developments that take place between the two that don't make sense. And what they said about the original people, and by the way, not just Can, but others who've done genetic work in Australia said they came from two lineages. Well, we know one may be Homo erectus, but where's the other one? But well, what about Neanderthal? Sorry to, to cut you off. What about Neanderthal? And they talk about Cro-Magnon as well, a result a of that. Story, yes, and they're around. And the beauty of the story, mate, is this. Neanderthal never got to Australia. So this is the beauty of this. Neanderthal is a hominid. Now, 100,000 years ago, there were there were at least 15 different species of hominid running around this country, mm-hmm. around the world. There's Denisovans that were in um, Siberia. Yes. There's Neanderthal. There's Cro-Magnum. Now, all, that, all this, all these different hominids, then one pops out from somewhere. 
Now, the, the trick is we believe it was in one country to begin with, Australia, then set sail. And then when it set sail, then the homo sapiens start to spread. The Africans come out later because the Aboriginals have already been to Africa and started that race. So we believe it all came from that beginning. But our question is, two lineages. Okay, we've got Homo erectus is one. What's the other? And we're getting archaeology that tells us the others are extraterrestrial. And that's not just what we're getting. We get this off the elders. The elders are pushing us in this direction. So what we're trying to chase up now is we know Humanity began in Australia. Modern humanity, modern man. Our question is now, what was the device? How did this come about? If you guys are telling us there's two lineages, well, I found Homo erectus. I can get Homo erectus to Australia 400,000 years ago. We've got archaeology for that. That's no problem. Well, where's the other one? What is it? What is it made Homo erectus become much wiser and more developed? Where did that come from? That's the question we're grappling with now. All right, that's interesting. So uh, I have the impression that you probably in agreement with uh, the work of Lloyd Pye and Zachariah Sitchin. Is that right? <laughs> uh, Sitchin and, yeah, well, yes, because... Uh, probably we, in principle, I don't know. No, no, more than in principle. I mean, I'm not saying what they're doing with their archaeology is right or wrong, because I know there's been arguments about that, but I am saying what they're generally saying is exactly what we're reading on one of the walls there. Now, remember, I told you, Arnie Bev told us there's Egyptian there, and we found it. I found a section on one wall that's 92% Proto-Egyptian, no problem. But in the older walls, with the older writing, I swear to you, um, and that's going to come out in an e-book I'm writing with someone else and it should be out in a couple of months, we think we've got the story of genetic splicing there, written icon by icon, symbol by symbol, telling us how they created something. It starts with just three circles, just the heads and legs. Then it has arms. Then it gets bigger, and you can see the development all the way through. We think that the idea that aliens came here and became genetically involved in what took place, and I think that there were different groups that came. And I think that one group came here to create a slave-like race that could work mines, but not in Australia. I think there was a different creation that took place here to what took place in other places. So I'm fully on board with Stitcher and what he's saying about that. I have no issue with that. In fact, I'm damn sure he's right. But I'm thinking, and I'm saying this, that I think that this genetic splicing we're talking about, don't think it just happened with one group of hominids in one place. I think it was taking place all over the place. But the greatest creation of all those splicings is in Australia. And I think that's where Homo sapien began. And all the other hominids we're talking about, be they Denisovans, be them Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon and all the other groups, some were played with, some weren't. I believe hominids were here to begin with when the aliens came. And I think some of them may have found this place too difficult to live on permanently. So what do you do? You create something yourself. And if you believe in reincarnation, which we fully believe in, and we believe the aliens know this is true, just make a vehicle to reincarnate in. That's what you've got to do. And we think that's what they were doing here. I think elsewhere, their, their intentions may not have been as noble. But we believe the Pleiadians are here because, Andy, one thing I need to tell you, I've been out throughout this country a lot. We've travelled in many states now, and everywhere I go, there is only one dreaming story that stays the same no matter where I go, and that's the Seven Sisters of Pleiades. I can go to nearly every tribal group, and I'll always hear the same narrative the same story, the same seven sisters, and it's the only dreaming story that runs throughout the whole of Australia. Why? Because I think it was part of the dreaming, part of their story. The seven sisters are the seven stars of Pleiades. So we think, and of course remember also, in this country, they do not call their spirits gods. They call them sky heroes. Mm. People get that mixed up. They say, oh, spirits. No, no, no. Sky heroes, they came from the skies. In fact, Aunty Bev told us what they came in. They came from carriers from up there. So when you look in this Aboriginal mythology, it's as much about where they came from as anything else. So remember in the dreaming stories also, the sky heroes created them. Now, we look on that as a symbolic statement, don't we? No, I don't. I don't. I look upon it as a statement of fact. 
this is what you will find. You will find at every dreaming stories, and that's why if you go to one land, that belongs to that particular sky hero. Well, you can't walk in there, can you? You weren't created at that place. You see how this works. Mm. So the very beginning, all of their stories are about Pleiadians creating them as sky heroes. Wow, this is so fascinating and exciting, Steve. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we have to take a break for a while here because, um, yeah, this is so exciting. I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll have a quick break and come back. <laughs> yeah, let's have a quick break for a couple of minutes and we'll be back. Have you ever wondered about mysterious realms from exotic lands far away? We've heard about India, South America, and Africa, but now it is time to explore the exotic lands of Indonesia. Exotic files, creatures, phenomena, tales and ancient mysteries from exotic lands. This book will take you beyond the boundaries of your imagination. The Exotic Files is a compilation of true stories from both the author and others, complemented by myths, legends, and folklore from the exotic lands of Indonesia. Read mesmerizing stories about aliens, ghosts, vampires, shapeshifters, giants, Bigfoot, dwarfs, ancient civilizations and megalithic structures, mysterious phenomena and artifacts and more. The Exotic Files, written by Andy McFar East, available now. Go to www.exoticfiles.net Welcome back to Farish Trailer Radio. This is Andy McFarish, your host. So far, we've been talking so much interesting and fascinating things with Steve. And I've got two questions in my mind. The first one is, Steve, uh, could you explain, or I don't know, about your views? How do you explain about all the races in the world? Like, I mean, you can see from the outside, people are different. They're people with black skin, with yellow skin, and also also the white skin and everything in between and uh, the difference in face features. So yep. can you explain those differences from, from what you know so far? Yeah, actually, I can explain it. It's not that hard. Now, mm-hmm. okay, remember, we, we are not. Our base race is not Africa. It's from Australia. Now, if you go into the middle of Australia, and I've got pictures that Donald Spencer took in 1904, mm-hmm. you will get pictures of kids, Aboriginal kids, full blood Aboriginal kids with blonde hair, blue eyes, and they have got the most, they look like basically something from Brad Pitt, okay? Really? Up to Tasmania, and because of the diversity of Aboriginal physiques, they decided, and people to this day still are arguing that the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, right, did not come from the mainland. They came from somewhere else because they're so different than mm-hmm. anyone else. Now, the biggest problem with the Tasmanian Aboriginal people was they had very dark skin, right, and very curly, short, matted hair, curly hair, which is exactly what you find in the equator. They were living in the coldest part that a human could live in. 
There are so many different types of original people. You can go from the very lighter skin through to deep purple within your Aboriginal race. So what you're getting there is when the original people move off to other places, they have the predisposition to have blonde hair, to have curly hair, to have straight hair, and to have all the different types of hairs that we have today. Mm. So it's not that surprising. And remember, when we talk about the original race, you you might be just thinking, oh, you must be talking about the Aboriginal people that you know that you see walking around. Are you including in the original race the little people, the Berenians that were three foot high? Mm. No, we probably didn't include them in the group. Are we including the really big people that we dismissed the call of Yowies? Well, there were a robust race in this country, and they were massive, absolutely mm. massive, completely different looking to the original people of today. So we've got three different types of original people we know of, and then you've got within the gracile group I'm talking about now, blonde hair, black hair, and all shades in between. So today, when you take that race and you put them in different genetic, uh, sorry, genetic makeup and different climates, yeah, they will change, but your base, your base is Aboriginal. It's not African. And if you've got a base that can have blonde hair and can have black hair, can have straight hair, can have curly hair, can have blue eyes, can have brown eyes, don't worry, you'll get your mixture from that. So when they spread around in the past, mm. um, did environment play a part as well? And and did they also probably, uh, you know, uh, get mixed with other races of hominids in the past? Yeah. yeah, I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt that environment played a part. And as for mixing with other hominids, well, I can answer you definitely, and I'll give you a specific example of it. In mm. Siberia, there are a group of people called the Denisovans. Yeah. Hominids. They're not Neanderthal and they're not Cro-Magnon. And yeah. you know what? They have a massive amount of mitochondrial DNA that is identical to only one race on this planet, Australian Aboriginals, but they're not even Homo sapiens. Wow. So there you go. You wanted to know, did they mix with other groups? Well, there's your answer. And you know what they did? The yeah, academics had a problem because we know that Aboriginal people can't sell. So what they said was, oh, the Denisovans must have sold from Siberia to Australia. I'm thinking, oh, you told us before that only Homo sapiens can sell boats to other countries. Now you've got a lesser species. It's not even Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal getting in a boat in the river between and starting to another country. Oh. 4,000 k's away. You're making it up, boys and girls. <laughs> so, and I'll go one step further. Last year, they did a, a survey in southern India, the Indian government conducted by Dr. Rao, and they did a mitochondrial survey of 937 Indian people. Now, these were Indian bush people down in South India in the islands. And you know what they found? Seven of the people aren't Indian. They're Aboriginal. They're Australian wow. Aboriginal. Their mitochondrial DNA is purely unique Australian original signature. So there you go. 40,000 years, maybe 10,000 years after they left India, you still have people in India that for all intents and purposes are not Indian but Aboriginal. Wow, that's so yeah, they still spread, they spread <laughs> everywhere. And, and that what we think happened, Andy, was the original people spread out and spread the, the precepts of the dreaming and all that took place. And they settled those regions. Then another group of Homo sapiens sapiens came out of Africa 40,000 years ago. We don't deny that the Africans came out. What we're saying is those Africans really originally were Australian original people to begin with. That's their gene line. Then they've come out as a different race. And I think there's been conflict between the first group of Homo sapiens, the original people, and the new ones coming in. So I think that's what that, they'll tell you. Oh, the two groups of uh, Africans that came out, one around 40,000, one much earlier, but we don't want to talk about that much. Well, you can't because it wasn't them. It was Australian original people. So you'll find evidence of the Australian original people all over the place. The oldest Homo sapiens sapiens skeleton found in Asia is found in Parat Cave in Malaysia. It's 10,500 years old. It's not Asian. It's Australian Aboriginal. Wow. So evidence is there. This is why we got published by University Press of America, because we found evidence, real evidence, hard evidence of genes, of skulls, of bones that are original, and they're spread all over the place. So, yeah, they were definitely out first. They came out first, and the Africans came second, and I think the Africans brought a different culture, and then there's a clash, and then we're sort of still wearing with it to this day. Are you saying at, at the same time also that they, they, they were Africans and they, they, they clash? 
Yeah, I'm saying that the uh, original people went everywhere and they started the Homo sapiens. And, of course, then after a period of time, each of these groups develop in different ways. I see. So so they, they all settle in the environment, yeah. whatever, and they become different people. Yeah, they do. They do. I mean, if you look at uh, – we've written a book. Um, we've written a chapter about the Dogon. Mm-hmm. Um, and it came from an article written called The Dogon and the Dreaming. And you find the Dogon's religion. They stole it. It's just straight, straight word for word, the dreaming, straight out word for word. And I mean, I think all, all power to them for keeping it so intact. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was everywhere. Isaiah religion, and uh, Robert Lawler said this, the Isaiah religion is a carbon copy of the dreaming. So it's there. You just need to look in different places at different times. You'll find them all over the place. Okay, so in the past, when they spread out, mm. um, well, I mean, they spread out in the past, okay? That's what I'm going to say, what I was going to say. And and uh, how come they stop now? They don't, they don't do that anymore. They stopped because mm. around about 8,000 years ago, humanity had a choice. Up until 8,000 years ago, if you look at the history books, you'll find there weren't cities, there weren't accumulation for everything. The whole world was living as hunter-gatherers under the precepts of the dreaming. Around 8,000 years ago, we find the beginning of money, a certain mm. uh, uh, a sort of sedentary lifestyle in cities. Now, once you start to have a division of power where some people have more than others, where you start to build armies, you're now building a lifestyle that's basically in direct competition with the dreaming. A nomadic, you don't dig anywhere, you move from place to place, you walk on top of the earth like a rainbow, that's something that comes from the dreaming. Now, you don't walk on top of the earth like a rainbow, you take stock and you rip the place apart. So you have two lifestyles now, that are in direct competition with one another. And what we believe is from that 8,000 years, the original people retreated. As lifestyles changed, they retreated. We believe the last two places they severed contact with were India and Egypt. Mm. They were the last two. And they retreated from all the other places. Oh, and they stayed in America, of course, because mm. the Asians came through with the second group of Indian people who came through, and they sort of shared a fair bit there. But in the other places... They pulled away because if we're not going to live in, under the precepts of the dreaming, why stay there? Mm. So we believe they pulled out. And the last two contacts, and, of course, that's why when they pulled out, the Egyptians started sailing to Australia from 4,770 years ago. They sailed here and they were here for 4,000 years straight on. They stayed here to keep that contact going. And that's where you get the mythology in all the biblical texts about this Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were naked. Yeah. There's, only one, there's only one continent on this planet until Cook came where everyone never wore clothes, Australia. <laughs> now remember, when um, Gar- the Garden of Eden, what happened was we had two sons, one mm-hmm. farm land and one caged animals. Mm-hmm. They're against the law here, and they were banished. Can you see the link? In Australia, if you farm the land, you're thrown out. You can't do that, and you can't ch- cage animals. So the two people in the Bible from Adam and Eve that were thrown out, they fell into these lifestyles. And if you read the Bible, it will tell you in the Bible it says that God said the person who was farming the land would never get the power of the earth. He didn't want you to do this. And it's written in about the third page of the Old Testament that what the farming of the land was wrong. That comes out of the dreaming. You see, that's what this was about. That story of Adam and Eve and the banishment is the banishment from Australia. So that's where, and that's why you get that story now, because that's what's happened now. We can't find the Garden of Eden anymore. Now we're looking for it. It's gone because it's retreated. It's gone back to the place where it came. So why did the Egyptians sail back here? Because they knew this was the Garden of Eden. They came back here. So it's basically like why do Muslims go to Mecca? Mm. It's sabbatical. This is why the, the sons of Pharaohs turned up at Carrion and Nefertajeb and Nefertaru, the two sons of the Pharaoh were here as a sabbatical. So that's why they retreated, to get back to what they lost. Yeah. The difference is Australia was the nudist land then. <laughs> exactly. And if you look at the Garden of Eden, it was mm. a sea, wasn't it? Yeah. That's so, interesting. And then all of a sudden they were hiding. And what were they hiding from? from apparently from taking from the tree of knowledge. No, there's, there's been a mistake in that because the, the serpent is wisdom. That's, what, that's the way it's been bastardized. That story was changed around. Because the serpent gave Eve wisdom, and this is what the dreaming wanted. But, of course, they changed that tale around and made the woman, the person who messed the whole thing up, and the male, the one who fixes it up after that, well, you stuffed it up, I'll deal with it now. Mm. And that's how religions have gone. They took the feminine out of this story. 
But in First Man, First Woman, which is the dreaming story, it was the woman who had wisdom. And you know what the wisdom was? We can create ourselves. And it's very specific what that wisdom is in First Man, First Woman, the dreaming story, but that was hidden. And then the man follows the woman's guidance and follows her direction. That didn't happen in the Garden of Eden, in the biblical tale, because they changed it. So when you look at all the religions, my friend, you'll find it all comes back to the dreaming too. Wow, that's fascinating. Now, the second question I've got in mind, this is something that's close to my heart because I came from Indonesia and I just would like to ask you the connection to Indonesia. And you mentioned about Flores. Oh. So could you could you elaborate on that, please? There are two connections, one island Flores. Now, let's not worry about the little hobbit people who came from Australia, because everyone got distracted by that, all right? The important piece of information, I think one of the most important pieces of information that came out of Flores mm. wasn't the little people, it was the other piece of evidence. What they found was between eight to 900,000 years ago, Flores was settled by a hominid. Now they said it had to be Homo erectus. Oh, crap. They said that because they've got not one bone. They just said it because they well, can't be homo sapiens because they weren't around then. My problem is this. The Sal de Flores from the mainland of Indonesia, by the way, it's always been separate by three major straits and 22 kilometers of ocean. Always. So we know that they had to sail there. That's what I was going to say. Sorry to cut you off. That's what I was going to say before. Uh, was there in a time that Australia and Indonesia actually were one land, but Never. not. All right. Never. It's always been the relation trench that separates them and separates them at Timor. So there's always been that. People have had that fallacy, but it's not true. Okay, please but continue. This Flores is the second closest island, the Indonesian island to Australia. All right, the second closest island. Now, this is what we found, that 800,000 years ago, we have unchallenged, unchallenged by no archaeologist in the world, proof of megafauna, and tools, human tools together at 800,000 to 900,000 years. Now, here's the problem. They lived there for a long, long period of time, and they came there from somewhere else. Now, to get that, to have a, a, a viable population that doesn't inbreed, you must have 20 people on your boat, and you've got to sail over 22 k's, and you're supposed to be homo erectus and you can't talk. Explain to me how you get those 20 people on the boat, Explain to me how you have the skills to build a boat that can sail 20 k's of ocean, of rough ocean like that, and if it can sail 20 k's with 20 people, could it sail another 40 k's, 50 k's to Timor, and then from there straight to Australia? What would you have to do to the boat to make it sail a bit further? Not much. The problem is, this is a skill that only Homo sapiens ever had, and here we have it being shown in Flores 900,000 years ago. What sort of hominid is getting 20 people together in a boat cooperatively and building a boat and sailing to another place. How do you explain to them where you're going by grunting? It's not going to work. Now, what's equally fascinating about Flores is this, that quite recently they discovered, discovered a 42,000-year-old deep-sea hook there. Mm. Now, what's fascinating about that is this. According to the genome studies, the Asian race came into being about 35,000 years ago. The book is 42,000 years old. It's got to be Aboriginal then. But here's the point. It's a deep sea fishing hook, which means they've been sailing a long way out to catch trevally and tuna and stuff like this. This is fairly sophisticated stuff. Mm. No one's supposed to be living there. You see the problem in Flores, 42,000 years ago, according to theories now, the Asians came into being, started starting coming into being around 40,000 years in Asia. They didn't exist before then. And the original people, if the theory is right, well, they came from Africa, but they didn't stop in Asia. They're not allowed to. So we have people living in Flores when no one should be living there, living a really sophisticated lifestyle and also hunting on the land 40,000 years ago. But we have evidence of people being there 800,000 years ago. It can't be. It can't be. Flores is as much a square peg in a sea around holes, as the Australian original people are. Because the two pieces of archaeology coming out of that place, and then throw in the little people, if you want to get real confused then, mm. what does it tell me? What's going on here? That Homo sapiens were sailing boats 900,000 years ago? Now, what's fascinating, as I said, it is the second closest island to Australia. 
So it fits in perfectly with our theory. And if Homo erectus came to Australia 400,000 years ago and turned into Homo sapiens, and they came from the south, came from Asia, well, guess what? They already sailed from Indonesia to Flores. If you keep sailing south again, you get Timor, and after that, you get Australia. You've got 400,000 years to do it. So yeah. we'll either entry, because what it does is it proves that either Homo erectus sailed to Australia a long period of time ago, or even further back, that Homo sapiens were sailing from Australia. Very important piece of evidence there. That Indonesian piece of evidence is vital because it breaks the story. Because nobody's going to tell me that Java Man was sitting in a boat. They're not going to tell me that. And Java Man is 400,000 years old. This is double the age. Mm. You know, Homo erectus has only just been around, you know. Some of the older, Homo habilis, which is really ancient, is just finished up. We're going way back to what's supposed to be pretty dumb human beings. As I said, how do you grunt in a way that convinces 20 other people to sit in a boat and sail 20 k somewhere else? You've got to be able to talk. You've got to be able to theorise. You've got to be able to build a boat. Well, I mean, th- these are skills that aren't easy to do today. If we got together as homo sapiens today, so let's build a boat that can go 20 k with, and we've got nothing. See how we go. With no tools at all, but maybe some rocks. Mm-hmm. So what have we got in Flores? We've got evidence here. And what we also find, so say, oh, well, they must have left. Well, hang on. What's that hook doing there 42,000 years ago? No. Indeed. It's very important. And then you've got the little people, the hobbits, that we didn't believe existed until we found them there. And they break another rule because we know they can talk and had a culture. Their brain size is smaller than the chimp. I wrote in my book about the Hobbit, anyway. By the way, um, and also the myth and folklore about them in Flores, and actually there were sighting about them reported. And so, what 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 do you, what do you think about the connection between the original people and the Hobbits? I have a picture of one. I've put it up a few times. We have a picture. There was a tribe. A tribe of Meridian people that Tinsdale saw in 1938 and stood with them. And there's a picture of Tinsdale who's the same size as me, six foot, mm-hmm. standing near the tallest of the Meridians of 150 of them. And he stood up to his waist. And he wow. was the big one. The women were smaller. They were under three foot. And do you know what? Mm-hmm. We had stories about the little people, the little folk, all up and down the coast being wiped out, mainly by us, of course. They were everywhere. And they were the wise ones. Whenever the, the tall folk couldn't sort out problems, they would go to the little folk and they would decide what the answers were. In one place, they were the keeper of the songs of the four winds, which is the most sacred song you can have. The little folk in Australia were the wise ones, the philosophers. Mm. And we believe that they are part. I mean, they're still around today. Every original person I've talked to today will tell you that unlike 1600 here, I can introduce you to dozens and dozens of elders who tell you, you talk about us, you don't leave out the little folk, they're still with us to this day. We have a story up our way where three kids were stolen by the little folk 10 years ago and they were mm. lost for three days. And when they came back, all the original people smelt and said, oh, they've been with the little ones. Mm. They've got a distinct smell. They're still around today. In fact, Nimbin, have you heard of Nimbin? It, no. it should be. Nimbin is actually net, out from Byron Bay. It's a big village around here. It's the centre of the culture culture group movement Australia. Nimbin is short for Nimbinja, which means place of the little hairy pit men. Mm. That's where they live. So, yeah, yeah, still around in our area. The little people, when I was talking about original people before, I included them. They're part of this story. And mm. they were exported out too. When they went out in the boats, it wasn't just the grass oil original people. The robust ones and the little ones were on the boats too. Well, oh. and why have you got little people in Flores? Because it's the second closest island to Australia and they sailed there. Mm. And how do we know they sailed there? Because they did. And every archaeologist in Australia will say, and the world will say, oh yeah, someone sailed there. Mm. All right, then let's work out who it is. Wow, that's interesting. Now let's talk about, uh, you mentioned about Palladian star Not- system connection. Mm. Um, are there any other star systems connected to the original people, or is it just the Palladians? Oh, the Orions, Bill. Mm. All and right. Durham, Durham Owen and Bolgandry, two of the most famous sky heroes and the two of the biggest engravings in this region. 
both have a rise built running straight through the center of them. So does that explain the variety of, you know, appearances? All of it. All of it. Mm. All of it. Because this place was special. Mm. Ah, they came here. I mean, I, I, I think you're going to find uh, there's, there's talk of Sirius, but that's more in Egypt. I think this place, what we're talking about here, the, the two stories I hear all the time, Orion's built, um, Pleiades, there seems to be a link there. If, if, and I always leave this at 99%, I'm prepared to say 100% the uh, Egyptians were there and I'm prepared to say the Spanish were there. That's 100%, that's given. I put it down at 99%. If the Pleiadians were here, Australia or Lemuria was their continent. That's where they were. That was their part of the equation. I don't hear, I, we hear acknowledgement of other um, star systems because the original people are obsessed by them. We're working on one platform of three and a half k's in length, and so far we're up to 4,000 separate star markers. They are obsessed by the stars because that's where they came from. But it's got to be Pleiades. I mean, we see the seven st- stars together. Oh, we see them so often now, we say, oh, there's the sisters again. They're everywhere. They're just a given. They're the focal point, but they were aware of the other star systems, but their veneration, and I'll use the words from an elder, a highly connected elder. In fact, when we want to go on the site up here, we have to get his permission. He told us how to enter. And as he told us many, many times, his grandmother, from the time this kid could talk, point up the stars and say, look up there at Pleiades. He said, that's where we come from. That's our place. That's our people. I've got a dreaming story from the last Elder, Uncle Reuben Kelly, Dungadi, mm. talked about the fact that his people came here in a spaceship made of energy, and when it hit the atmosphere, it turned into crystal and exploded. Mm. They are definitely from here. And what we're finding all over is we're now finding archaeology. Are you going to put them out in your new book later on? We're putting all this stuff out. There's a couple of books coming out in the next couple of months. We've got an e-book I'm coming out. We've done with one person. I've got two books coming out with a big group that are going to publish it and put it out in print. It's all coming out pretty soon now, but again, it's where there's lots of pictures, but they're all sh- close ups. We have no long shots. That's banned. We've got people photographing. We've actually photographed people standing near the rock that have never held a divining rod in their life, but it just spins out of their hands and you can see by the looks in their face what's going on. But all of it, short close ups, no long shots. We don't give up anything. Okay. We're best from doing long shots and we don't talk about places. Um, yeah. I'm sorry for the limitation of time. I have to ask you just one more question <laughs> before right. before we go. <laughs> this is so fascinating so far. Um, I've heard about your interview probably a while ago. I can't remember where it was. But you were talking about the 2012 prediction, what would happen then. And, uh, you know, you relayed the messages from the elders and everything else. So, but we know that the 2012 scared or 2012 uh, crisis or to, has passed and uh, what do you explain to people about about, about that? I, do, I explain it this way, that um, there was an ascension on that day. I didn't. I think people were looking to the skies or looking on a cross or something, to looking for something that they could wrap their head around and say, oh my God, okay, I'll be led to the promised land because I don't have a choice. That was never going to take place. I never thought that was going to take place. What I thought was going to take place is I thought after that date, there was a tipping point where the forces that are trying to do things properly would 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 be in the ascendancy. And what I've seen since that point has been exactly that. Um, from our point of view, from what we're doing, from December the 10th, when we were taken off the national radio, uh, that was obviously from the wrong side of things. From the point of view of what's taken place since, we have seen so many sites and been given so much information. And I know, I know that when we get to see something later on in the year, and I can explain how this works, the elders are going to show us something that no person in the world can argue against. I can't say what it is. That's why I've got to do seven days in the bush to learn the words to walk onto this site. Mm-hmm. Now, they told me, that it has to be on this date because that is the date when one of the major symbols, engravings, is in alignment with a constellation. Do you understand that? It's the mm. const- These guys are looking to the skies, not to the, the ground for when they're going to do this. We got into trouble from this group because we were ahead of them because they weren't ready. But they put up with what they're doing because they know we're doing it the right way. But we're of the opinion 
that from December the 23rd or 21st from last year, the tipping scales went our way. And from that point on, the people are trying to work for change. It's taking place all over the world. You only have to look around the middle of the world now, in the Middle East and all of that area. I'm, there's, there's, a, there's an agitation for change. They don't know where they want to go, but they know that what's there is wrong. So there is a, a change that's taking place, but it needs to build to form into something. And that's what's taking place now. I've got no doubt about that. But if someone's looking for the Pleiadians to come down in a massive mothership and wave and say, follow us and we'll teach you what to do, don't expect that. Mm. It's just not going to happen. Each person from the point of my take is this, from the 21st of December last year, each person is fully accountable for what they do from now on. They can't say, I didn't know anymore. They can't say, I wasn't aware. No, you chose not to look. You heard about it, but you looked the other way. That was your decision. I think that's what that was about. I didn't expect, and I would have been utterly disappointed if there'd been some really in-your-face event that everyone says, oh, shit, those hippies and all those weirdos. Mm. That would disappoint me because that means you have people on board that didn't deserve to get on the boat. I'm not saying with you know, basically that. Mm. I think what's going on now is this is the last period the next year or so, and I know the original people are talking about some dates towards the end of this year. They think are pivotal. But I think the gestation, the nine months I spoke about, mm. that did, did, did take, take place. Mm. The different people felt something that might have happened to them for 20 or 30 seconds and felt unusual for a second. It wasn't going to be more than that. It never was. But from our point of view, we've seen nothing since then, um, nothing that doesn't fit into that change. And basically, what we're doing is with the elders, we're, we're trying to facilitate that change. We're doing a little bit, a little chapter, a small little part of that story to get the truth out. Yeah. The truth it's, is yeah. that the story about Pleiades and the story about the original people, what we needed to work out is what the hell did they give them? What did they teach them? And what have we never asked? That's what we're trying to teach people now. Well, that's interesting. You know, because I've heard some people saying, well, this is just a hysteria and while other people also saying we might have even fallen into a different timeline, that's why nothing happened. But your explanation is quite different. No, my explanation is that um, the humans, um, if we, we get put on this place to make our own decisions and be accountable for our own mistakes. You can't have someone coming in front like they want, someone descending from the sky and showing us what to do. That was never going to be the deal. Mm. The deal was that there are slow, slowly... Vibrations are lifting, and a lot. And I'm going to tell you something now. Those vibrations lifting are affecting the original community. You go out to any town right now and I'll talk about the number of deaths of original people. They are dying on mass. Wow. To tell you that. You talk to the elders, and I tell you, all our people are dying this year. Mm. Lots. I mean, a lot of the kids I taught for Maury are now dead. Kids that were young kids dying when they're 35, 36, and stuff like that. They shouldn't be dying that young. It is happening. There are changes that have taken place, but they're subtle. They're never meant to be in your face. But I am going to say this. Um, if you want changes that are going to be more in your face, that will take place, but it'll be too late then. You've got to make your decision before that happens. Some skeptical people might say they die because they have disease. So what, what, what do you say about that? I would say to you that the original people are more sense, sensitive. They've always been more sensitive to the spiritual side of things and they're more empathetic towards it. And because a lot of original people are diseased, and using poor diet and getting the worst because whoever is the most dispossessed will be the most unhealthy. Mm. Sparing it and they're showing it more. And I know there are a lot of original people are talking about the change that's coming and they sense it, they feel it. A lot of them can't feel it anymore and those ones are dying. I think there is a change afoot and I think the original people sense it at the moment. But you've got to remember, if there's a change in vibration and there's a change in spirituality, the European race will be the last ones to feel it. Mm. Come on, we've got some blocks up. We've got some massive blocks up all around us, our culture, the way we've been brought up, our conditioning. We will be the last ones to sense it because we've been preconditioned not to sense this sort of stuff. But the original people I talk to, the ones that are really empathetic, and I mean the ones who know the old ways, to a person, Andy, to a person without any exception, they tell me the change is coming. But not mm. one of them, not one of them said to me, the 21st of last year, oh, something's going to come out of the sky and it's going to run in your face. No. Mm. The people who want that, they will never get a change. Yeah. 
And remember this, if you go back to the Gnostics, they'll tell you, the change starts from within first. Once you change within, you'll sense it more. I sensed it. Well, it's been so fascinating talking to you, Steve. Um, and I really appreciate your time sharing your knowledge and your research with us. And our listeners will sure appreciate that too. Uh, please tell us again how people can contact you and follow your work, buy your books and everything. Have you got a website or anything? Yeah, we do. I think the best way to contact us, and I, I'm an utter Luddite, so I warn you in advance about that. My son does all that sort of stuff. Mm. We've got a website. It's uh, www.forgottenorigin.com, and in that we've got a lot of the stuff we put up. I haven't put it up recently. The problem is, and I must apologise for that, I don't put up a lot of recent stuff on there because most of it is so, um, well, it's not ready yet. It's not really. It'll come out in the books and then we'll start putting it up. And um, we've got to be so careful with it first. But there's yeah. a lot of stuff there. As you said, there's plenty in there for people who want to look. I think you spend days in there with what's there anyway. Mm. All right. Well, thank you for that. Pleasure. To our listeners everywhere in the world, we thank you for listening. And thanks again to Stephen Strong for his knowledge and research to share with us. I hope that, uh, that the interview helped in any way. Great.